longest time and how do we think it's going to change um, post COVID-19? And I think one thing we guaranteed of it is going to change. There's no doubt about it. I think everything's going to change. Um, and we can either hide from it, you know, what fear stands for, forget everything and run, or face everything and, um, and survive. And so we are actually doing the second one. And we're looking at it from a humanistic point of view. How are we going to be looking at our, our what everybody terms human capital post COVID-19? So in light of that today, I have Matthew Cunahan with me, who's a renowned actor and a producer, and I'll let him introduce himself and give you a bit of background about him. Over to you, Matt. Well, for starters, thanks for having me. I'm glad that we could color coordinate in our studio here. Yeah? Um, I'm Matthew Cunahan. Just a brief kind of introduction to myself. I come from a psychology background, uh, studied psych, and went off and performed for years, as one does when they walk away with a psychology degree, traveled the world with many shows, and gained some amazing experience on local and international stages. Brought that back into the space of education, worked as a drama educator for many years at some of Johannesburg's top um, private institutions, and um, the world of entertainment called me back and I am producing um, for Showtime Management now and Linda and I have maintained a bond through that this process and um, we both hold theatre dear and near to us and that's how we've kind of come together. Absolutely, so let's just build on that for a second. Matt and I uh, met running a festival, we were doing the marketing side of the festival and he was um, doing all the coordination of the programming and the shows, etc. It was just such a fascinating unfolding um, for me to watch what the theatre process goes through. And although there are so many similarities between how business conducts business, there are also numerous things that business can learn from uh, the theatre and the way in which they put on a show. And that's really what we want to cover today. We want to cover the case for just looking at how we present our business and how we take our business to market and maybe introducing, maybe think of introducing some of those concepts that theatre uses and Matt will help us go through that. Just before we get stuck into that, I'm going to ask you to do a poll with us and really it's um, does your place of work value individuality and maybe Matt can just expand a little bit on that for us. Well, I mean, we're asking the question knowing or predicting what a couple of the answers are going to sure. be, right? But I mean, the idea of the individual, there is no whole without the individual. Yes. So, you know, it's it, the whole is always made up of the sum of its parts. And we are putting it to you today as organizations that we need to take care of our individuals. And more importantly, individuals need to take responsibility for themselves yes. in this process. So at an organizational level to, to perhaps <clears throat> acknowledge the importance of the individual and the individual to kind of go, I'm going to take responsibility in uncovering who I am and owning who I am within the context and the scope of my organization. So, yeah. Sure. So if you just want to give us some background from your organization is do they value you as an individual? In other words, are you allowed to be slightly different mm -hmm. or, or and do they talk about individuals or do they talk about HR and sales and they don't really speak to the individuals within it? So we'll give you a few minutes just to fill that in. Also, try not to approach it from the perspective of do you wish your your place of work? Yes. Would, yeah. would, would value you? Go, oh, go to where it is now. as now. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's important. And, and the reason it's important is because now if you're an individual and you're all by yourself working at home, you must be feeling very lonely if you are not seen as an individual and you are seen as, as a group mm -hmm. and referred to as a group. So that is one of the reasons we want that. So we'll give you, we've been chatting through it, so I'm sure that maybe by now you might well have answered that. It was quite an easy question to answer, but you might have had a bit of hassles with getting your QR code side up and running. So we'll just give you two more seconds or so, and then we'll move on. Absolutely. I often look at those slides with emoticons and I think, what did we do before we had emoticons? Right. Yeah, I know. It's They are just so useful. I use them all the time and when my children started to use them, I thought, what whacked out idea is that? And we've, seen, we've seen all these messages that come through these days and they could just be a string of emoticons and somehow yeah. you can decode them. You'll decipher them. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, so let's move on. Um, as you're aware, if you've attended one of our previous webinars, we, we sort of contextualize the subject that we're going to talk to in the first 
short while. And then we give you a four focal areas, which we think you should really focus on to try and understand the given situation. So the four focal areas that you're wanting to cover today, I'm going to take you through now. But before we to go through that, I just want to talk about, you know, human capital, your most valued asset, human resources, and that, yeah. Yeah, I was, I'm just looking at those and I'm kind of going, but these are our people, right? Yes. So it's our talent. Yeah. Okay. So Matt was looking at that and saying to me, you know, so <laughs> what is that? Is that what we refer to in theatre as talent? So I said, yeah. It's just, it, it, it strikes me as bizarre. You know, human capital is something you park in a garage. Capital, an asset, it depreciates, it loses value. It might appreciate, you know, yeah. but I kind of just go, it's such a, it, it, it has no personality, it has no life, it has no soul. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's, it is, it's a very mechanistic approach to it. So we were looking at it and we were saying, you know, how do you show that, how do we change that, you know, and what would it be? So we were coming up with ideas like human potential, people power. Yeah. Um, you came up with a nice one. What was it? The potentials. Yes, the potentials. We like that one. Um, people ingenuity. You know, just some thoughts to think about because, unfortunately, I just wanted to say. Sorry, to interrupt you there, but something that interesting that you've always spoke, you've been very strong about it. at talk to us is the lexicon, the language, yes. the body of language yes. we use to call things and to name things gives them power or strips them of power. Yes. And it's just so interesting. There's a nominal determination that's almost a sign to yes. an asset. Yeah. to capital that doesn't have life and, and personality. And it dehumanizes it. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so as well. And you know, we also refer to those things as not the serious things. We say, oh, these are the soft stuff, you know, and it's pink and fluffy. And I mm. think if anything, I really do hope that people have realized that that is what drives your business. The people in your business are what drives your business. Without that, if you go to your office, during lockdown and even in some accounts now, it's a big building with expensive equipment and fancy furniture. The people are what drives your business. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time that we look at human capital. The potentials. The potentials. We'll call them <laughs> the potentials differently. And you know, I think the other thing is that they were saying, oh, we can't measure what we put into it and how do we measure it? And they're trying to value it with rands and cents. And I don't really think that that makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense. You know, they say it's a bit like herding cats. Who can herd cats? Well, no, I want to put it to you that there is a way that you can do it. There is a model to get everybody pulling in the same direction. And this is a new way of thinking. And this is what we're going to be discussing today is what is that model? And I think that's really important. So the four key focal points that we're going to be speaking about at Lens today are generalization versus individualism, um, awareness of self, and that's similar to self-awareness, but slightly different, and we'll cover that shortly. And then uh, values alignment. How do you align your personal values to the organization that you're with, and why should you? What is the point behind that? And then a disciplined approach to stay in your own swim lane. We spoke a bit about that last week, but I think that's really important. Otherwise, everybody just crosses over into each other's lanes and gets stuck in those funny orange things that float in the pool. <laughs> and if you get this right, hopefully you'll get a standing ovation, which is something that we've been always on about because that's what we're trying to do. So I'm going to sort of start a bit and Matt will chip in because that's just the way in which we work and that's great. But, um, you know, if you look at any organization, the core of an organization and its reason for being is to have satisfied customers and get a great following so that they can build the business. That's what every organization wants to do. Um, and theatre wants to do the same. Absolutely. They want to get bums on seats and then they want to get a standing ovation and for the show to do well so they can lengthen the run or that they can take it to another place. So there's a lot of similarities there. And if you have a look, there's sort of, I'm going to go through these stages that a business does. Is you brand yourself, you go internally, you say, what is my purpose? Why does that mean anything? How do I want people to betray me? What is it that I'm taking to market that is so excited? That's the branding side. Once you've worked that out and you've put the narrative together, you say, well, then now I'm going to go and attack the market. Where is my market? Where do I find them? Um, how do I reach them? How do I package my product? And you go and you take it to market. And then you, you might or you might not align your people. There are often instances where I've walked into an organization. I said, I've seen an advert for this and this and this product. And the people behind the counter look at you as though to say, okay, well, that's cool, but we don't know about it. Um, and then there's the go to market, which is really putting it into the market. And if you get this right, 
you'll get customers. Um, and you'll get some happy customers and you might get some unhappy customers, but we're hoping that we're going to get happy customers all around and you'll make some money. Now, the model I spoke to earlier is a model of theatre, and I think there's a lot of similarity. And that's when I said, when Matt and I were together running the festival, I just found this so interesting because there's a step missing in our model and something missing that we can do differently in business. And it's something that's a takeaway from theatre. So Matt, over to you. Yeah, so moving on to the next, on to the next one. We, um, we've, we've got very similar, similar processes, but I think we explore these processes in different ways. And we, we might emphasize a particular step um, in, a, in a kind of a heavier way. So your, your first step in, in business was branding, right? Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of research. What does an audience want? What are they prepared to? What are they prepared to sit through? And um, there's a lot of there's a lot of research into price points. Um, you know what might work in Johannesburg might not necessarily work in Cape Town. Sure. In fact, we've taken shows to Cape Town before that have been an absolute success. We kind of plan the shows 18 to 24 months in advance. We think, okay, this is a similar themed show. It's going to go well in Cape Town. Ironically we end up with, uh, with a completely different result. So I think that there, there's, there's a degree of guesswork, but the point is we spend a lot of time kind of really investigating the markets sure. and understanding what, they, what think, they're looking for. Yeah, and I think in some instances, business doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. They've got a great product, and now they're going to make they're going to make people want their product. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think theatre does it slightly differently. Sure. They say, what do the people want? How do I actually package it so that I'll get the right to turn around because I've only got eight weeks mm -hmm. or two months. I don't have a lifetime to do this. So there's a difference there. And, and I think that's key. Also interesting with, with theatre, and I, we, we shared this over a cup of tea earlier, the idea of a show that is a producer's dream is not necessarily a creative's dream. Sure. Okay. And as a producer, we're looking at bottom line, which is what business is ultimately looking at, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've got to, we've got to be able to get bums on seats. And sometimes we've, we've got to walk that fine line between being something being creatively sound and exciting for the cast or for the creatives, mm. but um, you know, and, and and in some cases we kind of go, we are prepared to put something out there because we know that the bottom dollar is going to be amazing and the creatives are just going to have to take a bit of a back seat in the process. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that business doesn't always get right, you know, so we, we're heavily involved in branding for companies and, and so one of the first things we ask is who's your target audience? And then they'll tell us and we'll take the brief and we'll design for that target audience and we'll come back and the management team will say, but we don't like that. And we'll say, well, that's not your target mm -hmm. audience. Your target audience is a completely different demographic. It's a completely different language. And, and it becomes a thing that either the business owner or the business management team like or don't like. Mm -hmm. It's not focused toward the audience. So sure. I think there's one thing where business can learn such a lot from theatre. Secondly, once we've once we've kind of gone, OK, we know that our audience likes a romantic comedy, for example, we start searching and we look at we look around the globe for the kind of production that is going to fill this particular need. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we, we may have ideas of shows in our mind and occasionally I think the step one and step two might kind of converse with each other. They're not mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. but there is the sense of now we understand the market, what their needs are, how they respond to maybe um, kind of violent dramas versus family centric dramas. Case in point, Jersey Boys in South Africa went down an absolute treat. Mm -hmm. it went down an mm -hmm. absolute treat. Mm -hmm. Okay. We take it to a we take it to a market like Malaysia, which is more conservative. Singapore also more conservative and more family based. The content doesn't necessarily translate in that particular market, you know. So you've got to find the right production in line with the research that you've done. Sure, absolutely. Yeah? And Matt would know about Jersey Boys because he was in it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Then then you go into casting, which is our recruitment. So exactly. So finding the talent, or as you would say the human capital or the assets. Now, this is this is a process which is incredibly important for us. At the end of the day, the audience don't interact with the producers. The audience don't interact with the people that are behind the wings, standing side stage um, or, you know, sitting in the follow spot towers. Audience don't inter get in interact with them. They interact and they engage with the actors. OK, and I was sharing with Linda that what's really interesting about this is that we spend and a mass or a, 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 a large proportion of our budget is allocated towards the casting process because we know how crucial the people are. 
I'm going to take it back. I'm going to say we know how crucial the individuals are. Okay, so that's, we, we will go into that in, in a bit more detail just now, but also just to give you an indication, 10% of our pre-production budget is allocated towards casting. It's a massive, a massive expense, but we also understand it's crucial in getting our, uh, in getting our staging and our production right. We said the word staging there, there but preempted there. Next, we move on to the process that you guys and, and, and people at home would understand as rehearsals, staging the piece, putting it together. And um, this is where individuals come together in their own capacities and they bring their own magic and they kind of, we put it into this cauldron of possibility and we mix and we stir and we, and we provoke and invoke and all those kind of different kind of things. And the staging process is, I think, what Linda spoke about earlier as, as the missing yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I don't believe that business does that very well at all. You know, I think we find the product, we've got the business, we find the office, we rent, we get the people, and we're going to talk a lot more about this, but we don't really prepare them well. We mm -hmm. don't script them, we don't prepare them, we don't let them understand how we want them to present themselves, how we want them to present the product. We just assume that their version of that presentation will be correct or their interpretation of what we're looking for will be correct. And when it isn't, then we get uptight with them and annoyed and disappointed. And so this area, I think, is for me a crucial area mm. where business can learn so much from creating a, a box office hit, so sure. to speak, you know. Yeah. And I think that we, we, we're not really very good at that in business. I think we need to spend a lot more time. So you'll, you'll, you'll have seen from the previous one, there is no staging, there is no creating the experience. And if it is, it's very watered down. And why is that really important right now? Because the person that you're dealing with is probably sitting on the other side of a Zoom camera. And if he hasn't been staged or rehearsed, he's probably not going to give the full story. He doesn't have a back office full of people or another friend in, a, in the meeting sitting there or he can't jump up and go and call the right person. And he also doesn't have all the props around him. So he doesn't have the fancy office, he doesn't have the the whiteboard or whatever, he's got himself, he's relying on himself and is he, if he's not staged or herself, they're not staged or, or rehearsed, they could very easily get lost and it might actually cause more damage than good. The other important thing about staging, Linda, is that, you know, getting a script it's not as simple, as simple as getting a script and performing it two weeks later. No. That script is interpreted by a cast of, call it 30, 30 individuals come together. And trust me, if you ask 30 individuals to perform that script prior to staging, you will get 30 different interpretations. Yeah. What's important <coughs> about staging that would relate to business is that it is a coordinated activity mm -hmm. and it is led strongly by a team that has a vision and has an outcome that has been decided upon upfront, there's a degree of malleability mm. and flexibility, and it's about finding finding the vessel for these 30, these 30 cast members to hop on so that they arrive at this destination, which we call the show. Yeah, and I think there's no debate that that works or doesn't work, it does. If anybody has ever sat in the movie house and stayed long enough to watch the credits, if you look at the number of people that roll over that screen, they from the the, the people who look after your toothbrush, right through to the people who close your caravan door, they've all got a role to fulfill, they all play a role, and they're all also seen as individuals and important. And that is what makes a box office hit and gets that standing ovation. And then lastly, the most obvious step is we've got a beautiful production that has been rehearsed in studio over the course of, call it, six to eight weeks. Sure. And now we need to take it to the point that it, it interacts with an audience. So we take it to stage, i.e. taking it to the market. We talk about curtain up, opening night. The audience is in the house and they are, they are waiting in anticipation for the excitement of what you have been preparing for them. And it's the same thing. You've got customers sitting there waiting to be to be delighted and to experience something. And as you can see, their, their rate of experience and enjoyment is far higher than in business. What was interesting for me when Matt and I were talking about this is eight weeks. I don't know of one organization who takes their people through an intensive course of eight weeks of how to present their product and present themselves and interpret what their narrative is as an organization. Mm. I think they employ you, they put you on a two days, 
uh, orientation program and then the rest of us work out for yourself. And then if it doesn't pan out the way it should, there's a, there's a sense of disappointment mm -hmm. by the leadership. And I think that's quite sad. So that gives you a bit of a broad brushstroke as to what our cases and what the cases that we're putting forward is the fact that we believe that business can learn a lot from um, theatre productions and more so now where you are relying on the individuals to take your business out there. So let's have a look at some of the four pointers that we believe are quite crucial. So the first thing we want to cover here in this um, generalization versus individualism is in business, when we find people and we recruit them, it's quite, in my mind, um, superficial. In other words, we bring them in for one interview or two interviews or even three interviews. Um, we have a look at a Myers-Briggs test, but it's all stuff which is superficial. It's it's something that we can do in our social media to create the right presentation. We, I mean, to create the right uh, projection of ourselves. There's nothing which really lies lower down. Unlike theatre, I think they're scuba divers. And maybe go. you can explain why. <laughs> and Linda, they even spot lit there. So I know, yay! So I think, I think the analysis of snorkeling versus scuba is so beautiful because scuba is deep diving. Mm -hmm. It is interrogative. It, 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 it is also, it, it tests yes. and it confirms or, it's, or, or it kind of, you know, kind of excludes the nonsense. Sure. Casting processes, like I spoke about earlier, occupy a lot of the, of the, of the pre-production budget it in does. terms of spend. Yes. Um, and it does this because it, we invest in, in lots of time in this mm -hmm. particular process. So going back to when we, when, we, when we cast shows, I mean, we're working 18 months in advance to cast the show. Yeah, it's a long time. So we, we're making sure that we've really got time to find the right people. And if we don't find, we go back to the drawing board to ensure that we do. Um, often, so you, you've heard of an audition. It's a, it's a basic audition. From a musical standpoint, I'm going to speak from that standpoint, you've kind of got a three-pronged approach. Mm. You've got to ensure that the person can sing, act, and dance. Yeah. So already, there's a level that you've, that you've gone to um, beyond the CV. You know, we are very much a doing, a doing business. People see. We can't tell people about what we do. Mm. We've got to show them what we do. Mm. So an actor comes into an audition room, they stand in front of you, and you've got to interrogate their ability to sing, dance, and act. Um, it is not just a given that they can hit the, the right notes. Um, can they hit the right notes but evoke something in their audience? To that, create that experience. That, that, exactly, to create the experience. And the experience is what is important. It's not about whether the actor can hit the right notes. You know, mm. you, you can have Pavarotti come in and sing the right notes, but can Pavarotti evoke what's necessary in the context of that particular production? No, you can't. It's got zero. So <laughs> you know, you know, I know that from experience. So, um, and I think the other thing that is important to me when I looked at the difference in the processes is, you know, we employ leadership and we look at their credentials that they were a leader in this organization or that they have got this CV or they've got those credentials. But really, do we know how they deal with people? And more so, do we know how they deal with your people? Because you really have got a cost. It's not like that person who comes into that business is going to go and recast the entire business. He's got a cost. And how can he adjust his style to suit your people to get the most out of them so that the customers will get the standing ovation? And I think that is a real challenge in business. And I think it's something where we can learn a lot from the, the theatre um, model. So interesting, obviously, when we cast, we generally cast from the ground up. So we go in with the assumption that there is no existing cast. However, it's, it's often the case that we have ideas of who we want for leads. In the production, the anchors. Where did you get that from? Okay. Because it's so visible. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. You went to a show watching this guy two weeks ago. Yeah, and you knew. Okay. So, so there, there, there is that lead. I've seen him in a previous production. In fact, I've seen him in the last five. Mm. Him or her, whoever, and they are exceptional. They must be in your production. Sure. So you kind of got an idea of an existing structure. The people that come in need to complement this. Mm. Um, so what often happens is we have these callbacks. So it's not just good enough to come in and deliver the script and the dance and the song no. and, and feel moved as a director in the, in, you know, in the seats. you kind of got to go, will person X be able to complement the core that we already have in our mind? And then you start the partnering process and you start looking into dynamic and chemistry, yes. which is exactly what you were speaking mm -hmm. about here. 
And I think business often doesn't have that. So you sort of look at the CV of somebody, but you can't see how how he's performing in his current role or in a previous role. It's not as transparent as sitting in a show and watching somebody put out their talent yeah. into the audience. So on that note, <laughs> let's just go to the next part, which is really where we want to talk a bit about awareness of self. And so we think there's quite a lot to talk about here anyways. So maybe, should we just kick off with that? Yeah, we've got a little clip. Yeah. I found this clip from, um, you may well know it, um, a chorus line. Um, and I know you're kind of going, I'm a business person, why must I look at a piece of musical theatre? Indulge us for a second and we'll chat about it. Sure. Larry, do you collect them? of a person I don't know. What does he want from me? What should I try to be? So many faces all around. And here we go. I need this job. Oh God, I need this show. I love it. I always I get goosebumps. I'm just going to repeat what, what this actor is saying. He's saying, who am I anyway? Am I my resume? Mm -hmm. That is a picture of a person I don't know. What does he want from me? What should I try to be? So many faces all around and here I go. I need this job. I need this show. It's the story of any actor, but I think it's also the story of people. Yes. All we want is affirmation and acceptance. We mm -hmm. just want to be granted that opportunity, right, Linda? Absolutely. Sure. And I think I think what's really important about awareness of self, and this is where talk to us can come in and, and bridge a gap, I believe, is you know, we, we look at that beautiful picture of, of, of those masks, but notice how far away from the skin those masks actually sit. They, they are so far removed from self that I you know, I really believe that what we what, what we really need to start doing is interrogating ourselves, introspecting, looking within. I think COVID has offered us that opportunity sure. because there's been a lot of stillness, there's been a lot of pause, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's it's offered the, the brave ones the opportunity, but I think it's also scared a lot of people off. Yeah. And people are going to be feeling fearful and kind of, what do I, what, what, what can I do? I, I'm feeling out of control. Why are you feeling out of control? We'll go there, mm -hmm. you know? And I think what's really important about the creative process, the staging process, is that the actors, through their skills and through their training over the years, have learned to strip away all these roles that they've had to play and they return to the actor, the self. Yes. And this is what we are advocating, is that there is a distinct difference between actor and role. Yes. I'm sitting next to Linda, the actor. Linda plays the role of a mother. She plays the role of a director. She plays the role of a CE you know, of a, of a South African woman. Um, there's so many roles, okay, but that's not who Linda is. It contributes, mm. you know, and I, I, I really challenge people out there to kind of go, well, who am I? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, you know, I've seen it in the time that Matt and I have, have, have known each other, which is now from about 2015, 14, yeah. somewhere around about there. It's been interesting because Matt also teaches um, drama, and it's been interesting because one of the first thing drama students do is to interrogate who they are and 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 for them to be able to strip down to who they are is difficult because as they were growing up you're the head girl you're the best hockey player in the school your mom's best little girl they actually lose who they are and it's very difficult for people to especially youngsters but i think as we grow older we just assume a role mm -hmm. and we don't ever get out of it so you know in, in this time period, we've spoken to quite a few business executives and they said to us, you know what's been really interesting is that I'm I'm not Mr. So-and-so, the CEO. I've, I'm, I'm busy in the middle of a, a video call and my son comes and jumps on my lap. <laughs> you know, like, and I just get so embarrassed. 
why do you get embarrassed? It is part of who you are, you know, and I think people need to try to strip those roles away. And there's a reason for that. You know, I'll tell you a very quick narrative of, I sold my first business. So I ran a business called um, Linmax. And after eight years, I sold that. And I was the head of that business and the owner of it and the, and the dealer for a company called Cispro and all the rest of that. And at the end of that, once I'd sold it, I'd lost myself because that's who I was. I was the, 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 the owner of that business. I had 55 staff. I had all those branches, but I really didn't know who I was. And it was such a difficult thing for me to come to grips with who I really am before I could take another mask because it was like taking that mask or throwing it away and now I've got no face. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really difficult. And I think that skill, which is taught drama students, is something that every human being should go through. And that's why the schools are talking so heavily about this concept of students going through this process. Because when you get into leadership roles or when you get into different roles in life, different people are going to want different things from you. And you keep on switching mm -hmm. masks to please them or do you know who you are and say, how can I align myself to that? And that's kind of like the next bit. But Matt's going to give a bit more about this. Linz, you just you mentioned this. Do, do I swap masks to please them? So here's here's the thing is that we are we play to to the people um, in the way that we think they want us to be. Yes. And what that does is it just takes us further and further and further away from ourselves. So you're losing this idea of core, of essence. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, we, we're going to get to the word, the, the big word that I that I really play around with in my rehearsal processes, and that is honesty. Mm. Um, we'll get there just now. But it is about stripping away. And in this process, what you are doing is you are making yourself incredibly vulnerable. Yes. Um, you know, and we, we'll get we'll get to vulnerability just now in terms of our feelings thereof. Yes, and I think that's important, you know, because by doing that, you are, you you become vulnerable. And if anybody's listened to Brene Brown and her talks on vulnerability and shame, you'll realize that to have a whole life, you need to be vulnerable. Mm. But you need to know how to manage that. Otherwise, you can have people walk all over you. But these are skills that we are not taught. These are skills that we're not taught as children because our parents don't know about them. Some schools teach them, some don't. Some kids take up drama, some don't. But if you have a look in general, children who have taken drama at high school fare better because they understand these concepts. They've had to dear dive, do a deep dive into themselves. And I think this is something that as employers, we should have a look at and say, how can we improve the performance of our people by helping them overcome a lot of these things? Mm -hmm. So let's just go into the next portion, which we find quite interesting, which is the values alignment. There's your word. There's the honesty <laughs> word. I just, I really wanted to make a, a point of this. In my, in my creative processes, I have two things that I want to, you know, aside from presenting a, a performance, which is the ultimate goal, obviously, you've got to bring something to an audience, to your market. The, the, what, the one thing that I always speak about in every decision that is made on the rehearse, in the rehearsal room is about, are you being honest? Is there a truthful element in what you are doing? And does it evoke joy? You know, um, they're two very, they two very, what might seem very simple things. But if every action is with honesty and joyfulness in mind, guided by those principles, guided by those principles. You know? So one of the things we were talking about here was values alignment. You know, I think people often wonder. You know, so my business has got values, and they integrity and respect <clears throat> and honesty and whatever, and they expect me to live those values. I, for a long time, said those are not really values. They're just words that everybody in the human race understands. And honesty is such a big thing. Mm. You know, so values are, are quite different. And Matt's going to go into that now. But one of the things that, you know, I've always said, and we were talking about it, I would, for instance, never be able to go and work in an avatar. That just, I could never do that because that's just so so the opposite direction to my value system. I just think it is wrong to kill an animal. Okay, I just, I couldn't do that. Doesn't matter what position I held. And that's the misalignment between my personal values and the business values. But Matt, you've got a lot more for that. Yeah, you know what? Hey, if you go through the process that we were speaking about previously about unmasking, of returning to self, finding truth, finding core, finding essence, honesty, acting with honesty in, in our actions, we're going to be able to start to unpack what we value. 
you know, as individuals, not as not as Linda the mom, Linda as the director, as Linda prior to anything that's been imposed or chosen by Linda. Mm. You know, we, we start to unpack that and that there's a process that we can go through to get to those points. And our values are never going to be completely aligned. No. The world would be a very boring place if, 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 if it was, sure. you know. But I think one of the tricky things is what happens when my set of values doesn't align with the demands of, in my case, the show. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I have been I've been asked to attend an audition for a role that requires me to be a conniving um, kind of uh, villainesque drag drag at it. Okay, which is so far removed from me. Okay, in my mind, we sit with with three options here. Mm -hmm. We either go absolutely not. It is a write off. Enough. I can't. It's so like working for the editor. Not yes. going to happen. Okay. The other thing is, I can go back to the drawing board as an individual, and I can interrogate myself, and I can say, at a particular point when I did my values exercise, mm -hmm. when I started to uncover who I was, okay, which should have already changed by virtue of having done that in the past. Remember, who we are is ever evolving, and I think that's really important. We'll get to that. But am I prepared to go back and? readdress that stuff and kind of go, am I still feeling that way? Am I comfortable with the fact that I'm playing a role and I'm not being me? Mm -hmm. So there's very much the role versus the actor, Matt, and Matt's core and essence remains intact. Mm -hmm. Am I able to side and separate? Your other option, you know, if you can't do any of those, is to speak to the piece and kind of go, okay, that is an approach that a particular director or creator in the, in, the, in, the, in the shape of business, it could be a superior, leadership mm -hmm. wants us to attack. Maybe leadership hasn't considered that the organization too has evolved and doesn't actually need that kind of sure. frictious, uh, or friction kind of value. Absolutely. And I think organizations, uh, if you remember that very first picture I showed, I said people need to be able to have self-awareness and reflect upon where they are and what they're doing. And if a number of these staff come back to them and they say to them, look, we're not happy with this anymore, maybe they need to relook at their values. So have a look what's happening with a number of massive brands at the moment in America on Jemima's rice, Uncle Ben's rice. How I, I can't remember all the names, but look how they're changing their branding because it doesn't speak to what the people are wanting anymore. And I think often we wait for it to hit the boiling point before we do something about it. We need to be self-aware a lot sooner. Mm. And, you know, we were talking about a very interesting model that um, Disney has mm. uh, when they bring their people in. So if you don't like children, best you don't go work at Disney <laughs> because you are going to have to act continuously. You're going to have to deal with children and be delighted with them, even on days when you're not feeling great. And that is part of what drama students learn. You know, so Matt and I were saying, you know, there are just days when you think to yourself, oh, I can't do this. And, and I, as an employer, don't want to have my customers pick up on that. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm going to go to the theatre, and I know this mm -hmm. because Matt did how many weeks of um, Snow White? Oh, geez, nine weeks. Matt did nine weeks of Snow White last, last year. And I know there were days when he just wasn't in the mood for it. But when he got there, it was he put that mask on and he performed. And I think people in business, and when we talk about individuals, they need to take ownership of that. Mm. You're there to do a, a job, and that job has got to be performed to the best of your ability at every single time you, 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 you act and you do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that you taught. And so Matt and I discussed that at length, you know, like imagine if you just drove over your dog on the way to work, how mm -hmm. would you feel and how do you deal with that? There's that beautiful expression, the show must go on, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're all familiar with. We talk about leaving our stuff in the wings. So there is there is a magic, and I know this sounds a bit airy fairy, but just go with me on this. There is There is a magic that exists between the wings, the portion that the audience don't see and the stage. Yeah. And there's almost like this dust that is put on you the minute mm -hmm. you walk and you transition from wing to stage. Now, we know that it's not a dust, but it's a mindset and it's a conditioning. We know that I am one individual that is part of a bigger team, a bigger picture, and I do not dare to let my other 27 cast members oh. down or the other 40 people of crew members around mm -hmm. me. There's that responsibility for starters. Furthermore, I feel really, really 
really um, respectful of the audience, the customer in front of me. You know, the customer that's sitting in the Tuesday night audience mm -hmm. is as important as the customer uh, um, that's sitting in the Saturday night audience. Yeah. Saturday nights are always a jaw. They're great for us. We feel elated. It's the weekend. Yeah. People have chill and all that kind of stuff. Tuesday is that first show of the week and you kind of go, oh, and I've got another eight ahead of me. Yeah. No, you've got to know that that person sitting there is the first time they're watching that show. And it's probably the last time that they will watch that show. And, and they, they deserve pay money for it. Exactly. Absolutely. Especially if they brought their kids to the show and it's cost them a couple of thousand yeah. rand. I mean, who wants to go and see um, Justin Bieber and he's crying the whole show through? You know. Yeah. So that's the reality of the situation. And I think in some ways, and this is our next point, I think business has become soft. I think business needs to take something here and 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 apply the same kind of disciplines, but not in an authoritarian way. They're going about it the wrong way. They need to do it in a way whereby everybody understands the role that they have to play, why they have to play it, why it's important and how they'll let others down so that you that you get the, the individual's personal pride and their personal commitment to something as opposed to a authoritarian push down of something. So, um, Last week we spoke very, very briefly about purpose and everybody sticking to their swim lane. So the leadership does one thing, the managers do another one, the staff do another. And and when I, we go to business and we identify areas in business which are a problem, we so often find that managers and leaders are climbing all over one another. Managers are thinking leaders should be doing something different. They're not doing it right. And because they're not doing it right, they're now having to do something differently. And the staff are sitting on the outskirts thinking, Guys, just make your mind up. We don't actually care and tell us what we need to do. And that's where you get that lack of commitment because people are just so tired of the drama. You don't get that in theatre. Why don't you get that in theatre? Because boy, oh boy, if there's one thing they're good at, it's absolute sticking to their swim lanes and making sure that everybody knows what their remit is and they do it to the best of their ability. So, Matt, you can give us some insights into that. Yeah, absolutely. But well, what you're seeing here popping up on the screen is just a very brief snapshot into some of the jobs that you might find on a typical production. These are the kind of the um, departments that you would find within a production. I'm not going to go into details about their, their, their particular roles because that's not important. What is important is that you can add probably another 20 categories to that list. And within those categories, so you're going to have a sound designer, you're also going to have a sound operator. Mm. So they, you, do you know what I mean? So there are going to be all these subcategories. For every one actor that you see on stage, mm. they are probably they are probably doubled, if not tripled, behind the scenes. Mm. So there are a lot of people at play to make a production mm. come to sure. come kind of take shape. And um, you know, um, what what's really important in this process is that you will never find a stage manager walking onto stage to read the lines of an actor. It's not their job. Simple, you know. You're not going to find a sound designer kind of leaning over the desk and kind of pushing a couple of lighting cues sure. because it's not their job and it's not their specialty. Yeah. So what we do is we have an immense amount of respect for the hierarchy that exists within theatre sure. and we, we we kind of go, you are the best in that at that job. I dare not try, you know. And you hold each other accountable. Absolutely. Because if, if the lighting doesn't work well, then nobody can see the actors. So what's the point? Absolutely. If the actors sing and there's no music, there's no point. You know, so it is, and, and part of this is, is that staging and rehearsal. Without that, they would never be able to pull this off. So it's a combination of the discipline and the staging and rehearsal that really gives you, you know, a box office hit. Going back to that staging and rehearsal, because it is the crucial key that we believe mm. is the, the missing link, right? Sure. What's really important is that if there's going to be any fluidity and malleability and flexibility, it is in the staging process, yeah. i.e. in the rehearsal process, business's potential missing link, okay? It is there where things are ironed out, where where um, ideas are shared and exchanged, and there might be a crossing over of jobs and opinions. Mm -hmm. But it comes a point where they go, but the audience can't be confused. They need to know exactly what's going on, and they need to know what they're looking at with clarity. And um, a, a line is drawn in the sand, and people go, right, from this point on, it is set, it's cast in stone, the ecosystem is established, and it must... Uh, it must work according to its hierarchy. Absolutely. And I think that's another thing where I say 
that discipline, I think, to some extent has been lost in business and we need to bring that back. So the next thing we're wanting to do now is just to have another quick poll. Okay, so if you haven't responded, try and finish it off. We'd really like to get the info on this. And then really, Matt, there we go. I think, you know, it's as simple as once you've gone through all those processes, it's a case of curtain that baby. Yeah. It's time to open the show. And um, hopefully that, that process that you've gone through, which which has by no means been painless. I think that's important. OK, Absolutely. there's going to be friction. There's going to be obstruction. There are going to be obstacles. It's natural. It's going to happen. But the point is, it doesn't happen in front of the audience. OK, the magic is maintained. Um, the the excellence, the excitement is what the audience are exposed to. It's not necessary for no. them to understand the rest. And, and they don't need to know it. They haven't paid for that. They no. paid for the story of Peter Pan. Yeah, and Simple. they want to come and have a good time and enjoy the experience for the money they've paid. And in business, it's exactly the same. I've paid for a service. I've paid for a product. I want to have a good experience. I want to enjoy working with that individual that I've worked with. I want to know where I stand if I want to bring it back and exchange it. I don't want to wonder if they're going to bring it back or I don't want to think, oh, if I have to go to that shop and face that person again now and try and explain to them what their own job is. Those are the things that really make business good and that, that make theatre good. And I think there's a lot of synergies. And I think I think theatre has taken the, a lot of what business do, the best of business, but business needs to take the best of theatre. That's the case that we'd like to put forward today. And if you do that, you'll get a you're standing, standing ovation. There it is. So, Charles, I don't know if you're ready, if you've managed to acquire the answers yet, or, or, or do you want to switch over? Yeah, thanks, Linda. I do have the results ready. I'm going to put them on the screen now and then take everybody through it. Right. Um, so the first question was, does your place of work value individuality? So 75% of the responders, respondents answered yes, and there was one no. And then on the quick poll number two, the three questions we asked was, do you see vulnerability as a strength or weakness? Everybody sees it as a strength. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, um, how would you rate your online presence? Most or least reflective of your essence. Uh, the average response there was 7.67. So everyone understands that to be vitally important. And then uh, thirdly, are you conscious of why, you're present, why you present yourself the way you do online? And everybody responded yes to that question. Cool. Were there any questions? No, there's no questions in the Q&A at this time. Thank you, Linda. I think organisations perform well when, they, when the people in the organisation understand the purpose. And I think the process of staging what you need to do, how people need to mm. act and react, I think enforces, reinforces the purpose continuously. Creates synchronicity. Mm. Right? Absolutely. Um, it allows people to, if they are if they are acting as individuals, they self-actualize. And if anybody understands Maslow's hierarchy, that is what you're aiming for in Maslow's hierarchy, is self-actualization and fulfillment. And if they are acting as individuals yeah, and not as puppets, then they will get that right. And then they should acquire followers because by all, for all intents and purposes, the, the people will enjoy what they're experiencing. The experience will be good, so you will get more followers. And if you get more followers, you will have a confident brand and great returns. Um, so that would be what success looks like if you take some of the concepts that are used in the theatre and bring them into business and adopt them into business, uh, especially around your people. And then the last thing that we just want to talk a bit about is that um, you know, it's something that we wanted to do a while ago, Matt and myself, uh, and never really got around to doing it. And with some time on our hands now, we are going to be launching um, the Talk to Us Backstage business. And what that is, is it's really about how do you achieve what we've just been talking about in business? 
So maybe Matt wants to take you through some of these concepts that we've put together. Yeah, so you, you'll recognize some of the terms, business terms, but we're trying to kind of create a theatrical spin on these. Yes. So spotlighting, i.e. highlighting where we believe there are opportunities, gaps, missed opportunities even. And taking business into the rehearsal room. So it's that key that we've been speaking about, which is about staging. So understanding that there is always work to be done. And we need to we need to offer ourselves the opportunity to play, to engage, to make mistakes in an environment that is safe, to allow ourselves to become vulnerable and to make ourselves strong through that process. Um, obviously, we can do this through the likes of personal coaching, group coaching um, doing kind of a, a series of interactive workshops, um, building self-awareness. These can be practices that, that that are done that are done in the comfort of your own home. Yes. They don't have to be. They don't have to be in fancy buildings around boardroom tables. In fact, preferably not. You know, yeah. self awareness starts starts in the morning when you wake up and you 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 expect that little spot of sun on your face, and for some reason it's not. Why? Oh, yeah. you know, maybe my eyes are not open as wide as they usually are. Mm. We're not blaming it on the sun. You know, um, I kind of like that. Yeah, it's a good one. So um, you know, building self awareness. And then creating a cohort of, wait for it, potentials, not human assets, not human, human capital. capital. <laughs> okay, these are people. They are people with souls, with hearts, with beautiful potential. And creating a, a an organization of these superhero yeah. potentials. Absolutely. They are ingenious. And that's really what we're looking at, is trying to unlocking that ingenuity in people. So um, really, that's us more or less for the day. We just want to thank you for attending again. We want to say that our next session is dealing with negative attitudes and, and we've got some really good ideas on that front. Um, and then Charles, do you want to close us off? Yeah, I just want to say thank you everybody for attending. Looking forward to seeing you again on the 2nd of July, same time, two o'clock. And uh, thank you, Matt, for your time today. Really appreciate it and I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Thank you and goodbye. Over to you, Linda. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Thank Maggie. You. Thanks for your time. It was great with you. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Cheers.